Challenging. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. And uh, we were faced with a challenge. Uh, we were supposed to leave Portland, Oregon at 10 o'clock at night. And uh, we, we got out of there a couple minutes late. We left at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, so we were about seven hours behind schedule. And uh, we finally got in, in home here about uh, 6.30. And we were supposed to be in at 10 o'clock in the morning. But God is good. Amen. So thank you for all your prayers. It's great to be back with you. Uh, if you'll open your bulletin, in your bulletin is a handout, and we're going to be needing that today as we go to our topic this morning is, are you a friend of the king? Are you a friend of the king? Now, I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do. If not, there's Bibles in the pew in front of you. I'm going to ask you to look up at three passages of Scripture today. Uh, the first one is in 2 Samuel 15, if you'll open to that, and then later on we'll go to Exodus 33 and John 15. But, and I hope you'll follow along in your bulletin. Take some notes of that half sheet. There's spaces there. You provide some notes. I don't know if many of you have noticed, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I've lost about 30 pounds. And God has been faithful, and uh, I'm, I'm already off one of my uh, set of medications. I stopped taking my blood pressure medicine about uh, two weeks ago. Yes, praise God. Give God the glory. God provides natural means as well as supernatural means of healing. And so I have to lose some more weight. We're trying to get my diabetes uh, under control. Um, and if uh, it's already dropped significantly, I've got one more point to go. If it drops one more point, I can go off my diabetes medicine. So that will be a praise to God too. But how did I get 30 pounds overweight? Well, I was, I was a great second helping guy. I would, uh, I would uh, you know, eat, eat whatever we had and I would always go back for more. I... I tried to get my dollar's worth out of the Golden Corral, amen? And if you ever took me to, to Captain George's, now I'm paying $29.95, I'm sure going to get my money's worth out of Captain George's, amen? I got overweight because I ate too much. And physically, that's not a good thing. But you know what? I don't think you can do that spiritually. I think you can, you can have a second helping of the Word of God, and it'll, it'll be good for you, not bad for you, amen? So my goal is, by giving you this half sheet, is that you'll take this home, and this week, you'll look up some of the scriptures. I'm not going to uh, go over them all in detail, but you'll look up some of the scriptures in here, and you'll make some notes, and maybe turn it into some prayer points for yourself. So I hope you'll have a second helping this week on me. Amen? And guess what? There's no, 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 no physical calories in it, but
but there's plenty of spiritual nourishment. Amen? So let's look. If you got your Bibles, I said turn to 2 Samuel, and that's uh, in the uh, history books, 1 and 2 Samuel, after the uh, book of uh, 1 Samuel there. And Second uh, Samuel chapter 15. And I'll be reading there uh, starting with verse 32. Let me set the stage for you. This is Absalom has rebelled against his dad. And he's trying to take away his throne. He's, uh, he's actually done it. He's actually proclaimed himself king. He's hired men to be his henchmen. And he's actually got the most the majority of the people at this point are for him. And David and his, his advisors and his wives and the rest of their children are fleeing for their life. Because they know that if they stay in Jerusalem that they'll be captured there. They'll be surrounded and possibly killed. So David is running away at this point. And that's where we pick it up. Verse 32. Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. This is very important. In the most desperate time of his life. David stopped and worshiped God. What, a, what an example for us. Sometimes we get all upset. I, and I, I tell you, I'll be honest with you and open with you, I was upset when they told me that, first of all, my flight was going to leave at 12 o'clock, and then it was going to leave at 2 o'clock, and then it was going to leave at 3 o'clock. And the reason it was going to leave so late was they didn't have the crew to fly the plane. They had to fly a crew in from Houston and that crew flew in, but they flew in so late that they ran out of time, so they had to fly another crew in from Washington, D.C., and that's what we were waiting for. And, you know, I, I can't sleep on an airplane. I've got some issues with my ears. I, I was good, but it just is not conducive to sleep. So I'd been up for about 24 hours, and I'll tell you, I was getting a little edgy. Amen? I not only smelled bad, but, I, you know, I was getting that grumbly attitude. I know, I know you all are holy people. That never happens to you, but Amen? It was getting all over me. And um, I opened the Word of God right there in the airport. And I began reading. And a supernatural peace came upon me. See, I, I chose in that moment to worship God. And it, it's, not a, it's not a theory with me. It's a fact. It happened to me more than once in my life. And David does that. In the midst of this terrible time, his life is threatening. His, his son is rebelling against you. It says there... He went to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. And there was Hushai, the archite, coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. Then David said to him, If you go with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as your father's servant previously, so it will now be your servant. So I will now be your servant. Then you may defeat the council of Athelpenfel for me. And do you not know that Zadok and Abitar the priest with you there? Therefore, therefore, it will be that whenever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abitar the priest. And the, indeed, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimehaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abitar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, I want you to hear that, David's friend went into the city and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you that, Holy Spirit, you take the Word of God and you counsel and you convict and you comfort. So, Holy Spirit, we ask you to do your job this morning among these people. We know that nobody's here by accident this morning. Everybody's here for a divine appointment to hear from you, to get their needs met, Lord. And you're a faithful God, and you promise that. So, Lord, I pray that in desperation this morning, we'd open our hearts. In desperation this morning, we'd open our minds. In desperation this morning, we'd open our spirits and just be transformed by the renewing of your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I pointed it out that while David was worshiping God, he was seeking God. He was praying out loud to God. And he was asking God to help him. And God sends him an answer to his prayer. And that answer is a man named Hushai. Hushai. And he is sent there to defeat the counsel of those who are advising Absalom. See, what he was asked to do is he was asked to keep David informed of Absalom's every move. And eventually, 
he did. And eventually Absalom was defeated and David was restored completely to be the king of all Israel and the whole empire. Don't, don't forget, at this time, Israel was a world power. It was like the, the British Empire. It was like uh, the, the, an empire that spread to the known world. It was a world power at this time. And David would return to be king of Israel and its empire. Hushai was an undercover spy. What, what David was asking him to do was to go undercover and to be a spy and to risk his very life for his friend, the king. And when David was on the run, he was fearing for his life, he left his pal and head up, headed up to the Mount of Olives. It was here that the king, while he worshipped and while he prayed, encountered his friend. When David arrived at the summit where people worshipped God and where he was worshipping God, Hushai the Archite was there to meet him. And he was already sympathizing with him. And the scripture tells us he had tore his robe and dust was on his head. And that's a, that's a sign of mourning. And David gives him the counsel that you don't go with me, but you go with Absalom. And you take all the advice that he's giving, he's getting, and you let me know about it. And, of course, David was able to turn that around, as I've said. And that exactly what Hushai did, he was able to save David and, and at the risk of his own life. And he was truly a friend. He was called a friend of the king. So the question for us today is, are you a friend of the king? You know, there's others in the Bible that have been given this title, this friend of the king. And, of course, we're referring to the Lord God Almighty. God in the Old Testament is truly called the king. Listen, Psalm, Psalm 5, verse 2. Give heed to my voice, O my cry. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my king and my God, for I will pray to you. Psalm 47, verse 2 and verse 7 and 8. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. For, the, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nation God sits on his holy throne. The God in the Old Testament is certainly looked on by the people of Israel as the king of the universe. And we know that Abraham was called a friend of this king. Isaiah 41.8. But you, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, of whom I have chosen. Listen, the descendant of Abraham, my friend. God, in speaking to Isaiah, calls Abraham his friend. Abraham was a friend of the king. How about Moses? Moses was a friend of the king. Now turn in your Bibles. You're going to turn back towards the beginning to Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. It's the other scripture. We've got one more after this, John 15, but let's go to Exodus 33. Moses was called a friend of the king. Exodus 33, and let's begin with verse 7 there. Exodus 33, 7. Then Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, when Moses went out to the tabernacle, all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent and watched Moses until he'd gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. That's important. Underline that. The Lord talked with Moses. The Lord met Moses uh, as close up close as personal as you can get at the tabernacle. Then it went on. It says, verse 10, And the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent. So the Lord spoke to Moses Underline this, face to face at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped. I'm sorry. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. As a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Now it goes on. We're not going to read it. But the next couple of verses, Moses says, God, I'm not going to go out and do this job if you don't go with me. I need you to go with me. If you don't go with me, I'm not going. And then God says, I'm going to go with you. My presence will be with you. You're my friend, Moses. Uh, a friend does not desert a friend. You see, Moses was a friend of the king. You know, it's always been 
the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's desire to have a friendship relation with us. Think about it. We were created to be friends right from the start. The friendship begins at the beginning in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. When the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because remember the scripture tells us, they said, let us, plural, create man in our image. It was their intent to maintain an intimate friendship with a special creation with us, with mankind. In the garden, God walked with, Abra with Adam and Eve, and God talked with them. And you get the impression as you read that, that this was a daily connection between Adam and Eve and God. You got a friend that you call every day? Is there somebody that you, you check with every day or every other day? You're just you're constantly bouncing things off them. You get that impression that, that Adam and Eve and God hung out together in the garden. It was an everyday thing. I don't know whether they had lunch together or whatever. They, they, I don't know if they played uh, 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 softball together or whatever, but they hung out together. They had a good time. They spent time together. Maybe that's why Jesus told us to pray in his bottle prayer. He says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, we need a daily dose of God. Amen? I found out in my life to overcome my demons, to overcome the things that, that tempt me, to overcome the things that try to draw me away from God, that I need a daily walk with God. See, how I walked with God yesterday won't get me by today. You know, what you used to do, I, I, as a pastor, I hear a lot of used to's. I, I, pastor, I used to go to church. Pastor, I used to sing in the choir. Pastor, I, I used to be a deacon. I one man tell me long ago, well, I used to be a pastor. Standing there, and he was asking me for money, and obviously uh, smelled of alcohol. And I was having some, you know, life problems. And we all go through that. But God is not a used to God. God's a now God. I need God today. What I did with God tomorrow doesn't get me through today. I need, a new, I, need a, I need a new adventure with God every day. See, and Adam and Eve had a connection with God that was a daily thing, that was an everyday thing, it was an intimate thing. They were friends, but the friendship was broken. Literally, Adam and Eve chose a new BFF. Now, what's a BFF, young people? Best friend, that's a text, would you text that? You're my BFF. Some of us old people need to get hip, amen? BFF means best friend forever. Adam and Eve chose a new BFF one day. They chose Satan. They chose Satan to be their BFF instead of God. But you know what's interesting? God still desired to restore that intimate friendship with them. Just like he desires to restore to us an intimate friendship. You know, God sought Abraham and Moses. And he sought them and he desired to have a friendship with them. And they did. And they were called the friends of God. You know, as we see in the lives of Abraham and Moses, being the friends of the king, they had a constant intimate communication. Abraham and Moses didn't have a monologue with God. They had a dialogue with God. Their friendship was defined by an open, honest communication. David had an open, honest communication with God. Just read the Psalms. David let it all hang out with God. David told God when he was unhappy. David told God when he was mad. David told God when he was upset. David told God when he was happy. David told God when he was full of joy. David communicated with God. They had a friendship. They had a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, as, before we go too deep into this, I want to give us a caution here. We are and can be the friends of a king, just like Abraham and Moses. But just like Abraham and Moses, they, must ne they never forgot this one thing, that this friendship was the, a lesser, that's the mere human, having a relationship with the greater, and that's the great God of the universe. You see, we are the lesser. Somebody say amen. And God is the greater. We must never forget that. And, and Abraham and Moses did never forget that. We must never trivialize our relationship with God. We must never take it lightly, which Moses or Abraham never did. They kept the position as the friend of the king in the context of respect and humility. A friendship that was focused on what we read in De Deuteronomy 10, 12. Listen, put your listening ears on. 
this is, what, this is where they stood in relation to their friend, the king of the universe. And now, this is uh, writing in, in Deuteronomy 10, 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord require of you? And we could put, and now Moses, and now Abraham, what does the Lord require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You see, to be God's friend requires us to, to understand that he is the greater and we are the lesser. But all that said and done, it still should blow us away that God, who is this all-knowing, all-powerful, all-transcendent God, the God who is all holy other, beyond knowing, the God who declares himself to be the I am, that I am, this almighty God, seems to value a friendship with his special creation, with mankind, with you, and with me. With all our warts, and all our downfalls, and all our problems, he wants to be our friend. He wants to be our BFF. You know, the New Testament role is to complete the Old Testament. They go together. The Old Testament, and then we have the New Testament, which takes the concepts from the Old Testament and brings them to completion. So, in the New Testament, we have a king. Jesus Christ is declared as a king. Matthew 27, 11. Listen. Now, Jesus stood before the governor. The governor's name was who? Pilate, right? And the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? So Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Jesus was saying, Yes, I am the king of the Jews. But you know what? As a matter of fact... Jesus is not just a king. He's the king. He's the king of kings. Revelation 17, 14 says, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he, Jesus Christ, is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Somebody say amen. Revelation 19, 16. And he, this is Jesus, has on his robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is a king, but he's not just any king. He's the king. Just as King David chose Hushai to, to be the friend of the king, Jesus Christ, now get this in your mind, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, has a desire for us to be a friend of the king. Now turn in your Bible to one more place, John chapter 15. John chapter 15, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hope you're taking notes. Hope you're using your insert there. John chapter 15, great chapter. You know, we're studying John on Wednesday night. If you haven't been coming, you need to come. The awesome book of John. We got Lazarus is in the tomb, and we're, we're going to be preaching on that or teaching on that this Wednesday night about the resurrection of Lazarus, but we're having a great time on Wednesday night. We also have a great study on Wednesday night called Breaking Free, right? Miss Tammy, raise your hand. Ms. Tammy's teaching that class. With, you, you can still jump in, right? You can just come. It's a video-driven class. It's great. It's about getting free of the things. So that's, that's also at 7.30 on Wednesday night. So I invite you to come out on Wednesday night. John chapter 15, great chapter. It starts out with the whole concept of being the vine, uh, but that's not what we're dwelling on today. I want you to go to verse 13. John chapter 15, verse 13. And we're going to read it through verse 16. Then we're going to break this down. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends. For all things that I hear from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain and whatever you ask in the fathers in the ask the father in, in, in my name he may give you these things I command you that you love one another I want to look at Jesus says you did not choose me but I chose you I was a dork do you still use that kids do we still call people dorks I was a dork I was a nerd I was a, I was a, uh, I was ugly uh, I had uh, gla I had to wear glasses in the first grade and, uh, you know, I, I wasn't very athletic, uh, and I was really dorky and geeky. And when uh, we would play games, we'd play softball or we'd play 
uh, soccer, we play uh, any team sport, uh, they'd always have to choose up sides. And I was always the guy that they said, well, we'll take Caskey if you give us, you know, you got to give us, if Caskey's on our team, we're a deficit, you got to give us somebody else. And it was, it, it, so I was never like the first one chosen or the second one chosen. I was always the last one chosen. And so I know what it's like to be rejected. Amen? So when I read about a God who picked me, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, the one who's coming back to rule and to reign, chose me to be a part of his team, that makes me feel pretty good. That makes me feel pretty good because you know what? I never knew what that was like. I was always rejected. I, now I know what it's like to be chosen. You know what? I'm somebody. I am somebody. God chose me. God is choosing you today. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your friend. He, he, he sought us out. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. He wants to be your friend. Now, you may not want to be his friend, but he died for you and paid for your sins so that he could make the way for you to be his friend. Number two. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, but a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friend for all, for all things that I have heard from my father I make known to you. This is intimate communication. This is not monologue. This is dialogue. Jesus wants to talk with us. Jesus wants to commune with us. Jesus is telling us through the Holy Spirit today what the father desires. What the father. Jesus isn't playing hide and seek with us. Amen? God is not playing a game with you. God wants to be real and open and honest with you. And Christ is. Christ told us, look, if you follow me, there's going to be persecution. He didn't promise, like some of the preachers on TV, that all your bills are going to pay, get paid off and you'll never get sick and all your family members are going to be happy. Jesus never promised that. Jesus said, if you come and follow me, you're going to face persecution. But he promised this, I am with you always. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Number three. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than he laid down one's life for his friend. This is what the greater, Jesus Christ, is willing to do for the lesser. That's you and me. Jesus trusted his disciples. He invested in his, you see, friendship precedes discipleship. Jesus took them as their friends, and then he discipled them. He established communication with them. Friendship is a key piece in your relationship with God. To open that way for discipleship. Just like now, to make a disciple, if you want to disciple somebody, you've got to become their friend. You've got to have open and honest communication to disciple somebody. Jesus was committed to his friendship with his disciples, and he was committed to his friendship with us in a sacrificial way. Jesus lays down his life for his friends, and that meant a painful physical sacrifice. Greater love had no one than this one. He laid down his life for his friend. That is exactly what Jesus did. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this greater love. Now, I need Scott and Chris to come up here. They're going to help me with an illustration here. Come on, stand up here, guys. Right back here where everybody can see you. You stand over here. Face that way. Chris, you stand on this other side of me. All right. Now, many of you know I was going to be a math major before I was called into to preach the gospel and to, to be in the in ministry. Uh, and I, I was always intrigued by algebra because the, the role in algebra in a lot of equations is to solve the equation, right? To, to find the x, what x is equal. And the goal is that when you find that x equals a certain number, you plug that number back in the equation and you solve the equation. Amen? Well, we have a couple of equations in the Bible. The first one is, and hold this kind of up to your, to your chin there, God... God equals love, right? The Bible tells us that God equals love. Then the Bible also tells us that God equals Jesus, right? So God equals love, and Jesus equals God. So that means we can substitute love equals Jesus, and Jesus equals equals love. If you get it, nod your head. All right, good. Thank you. Give the guys a hand for helping me. Thank you, guys. All right, so now we know that Jesus equals love. So we can take 1 Corinthians, which is the love chapter, verses 4 through 8, and we can substitute Jesus in that passage for the word love. 
So what we're doing is we're taking out the word love because love equals Jesus and Jesus equals love. We can substitute Jesus for love. So this is what the rendering of that would look like. Put your listening ears on. Listen. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Substituting the Jesus for love. Jesus suffers long and is kind to his friends. Jesus does not envy his friends. Jesus does not parade himself which means he does not force himself upon his friends. Jesus is not puffed up to his friends. Jesus does not behave rudely to his friends. Jesus does not seek his own, but seeks the best for his friends. Jesus is not provoked to think evil of his friends. Jesus does not rejoice in the iniquity of his friends, but rejoices when his friends get the revelation of truth. Jesus bears all things with his friends. Jesus believes in his friends. Jesus puts his hope in his friends. Jesus endures the failure of his friends. Jesus never fails his friends. Greater love has no one than this, than Jesus Christ he has for us. And the last one, verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command. What, this is what the lesser, this is what you and I must do for the greater Jesus Christ. We need to do what Abraham and Moses did. We need to do, apply this, and I believe that I have it in your insert. If you look at that in your insert, Deuteronomy chapter 12. And now, I want you to put your name in there. So when I say it now, I want you to say your name, okay? And now, Don, you guys didn't do it. I'm going to say a now, and I want to put your name in that blank, okay? So I'm going to say a now, and your name's not Don. It could be, but some, it's not the majority of you. So let's try it again, okay? And now, very good. What does your God require of you? What does God want of you to be his friend? What is required of you by the king of kings? Here it is. To fear the Lord your God, and that fear is not scary fear. It's, a, it's not a terror fear. It's a fear that means to respect and to so admire somebody that you're afraid of offending them by, by doing something that, that, that offends them. To fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Wow. I need to say it backwards. Wow. You'll get it later. This is hard, man. This is hard. This means giving, giving all my life to God, everything I do to God. And you know what? Sometimes I don't do that. Sometimes I fail. So what do we do? What do we do when we, we blow it? Well, how many of you here have ever had the fire department come in school and teach the kids what they're supposed to do if they catch on fire? What are you supposed to do? Three words. Stop, drop, and roll. And I would do that, or, but I'd never get up, okay? So I, if I could, I would stop, drop, and roll for you. So imagine me stopping, dropping, and rolling on the floor, okay? That's exactly what we need to do when we blow it with God. We need to stop. We need to stop sinning. We need to stop doing it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.34, New Living Translation says, Think carefully about what is right. Stop sinning. Amen? Look, I work with addictive people. I work with people struggling with addictions from alcohol to drugs to sex to pornography to food to anything that they put in their life that's a God. To, during the, Whatever you turn to in a time of stress, if it's not God, is an idol to you, and you can get addicted to it. First thing I tell them is you got to stop using whatever it is you're using. I can't help you till you stop dumping the drugs in your system or the alcohol or, the, or you stop looking at the pornography or you stop doing whatever it is that you're hooked on. Because as long as you're hooked on it, that thing controls you. But just take it one day at a time. Take it one hour at a time. Whatever it takes, you have to stop sinning. Stop. Drop. Drop to your knees and pray. Look, when I first got saved, I put this scripture on my mirror every morning. I put it on the dashboard of my car because I had so much junk in my past, the devil kept dragging it up. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess it. Get it out. Get it over with. Get it under the blood of Christ. Don't let the devil keep beating you up when you blow it. Amen? Stop, drop, and roll. Roll away from the bad. Roll away from the bad. Turn to the good. Listen, we're going to close with this. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Don't turn there, just listen. 43 through 48. If your hand causes you to sin, 
cut it off. It's better for you to enter life main rather than having two hands and go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, and where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire of hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Do you get it? Do you get it? Roll away. Roll away from the bad behavior. Repent. The word repent means to be moving in one direction and to turn around and go in the other direction. That's kind of radical to cut off your hand, cut off your foot, and plug out your eyes. But you know what? Some of you need to be very radical in your life. There are things in your life that you're doing that if you keep on doing it and the Lord comes back, you may not go. I don't know how much sin you can carry into heaven with you, you know. I'm trying to enter through the narrow gate, the Bible says. For wide the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life. Yeah, I've, lost, I've lost weight now. I'm getting skinnier. I can, these pants I couldn't used to fit into, amen? This is an old belt from about 10 years ago. I want to get through that gate. And I want to walk down that path to heaven. I'm not going to try to you know, negotiate with God. Well, can I do this? And can I take this with me? And can I still be doing that? And I don't know. I'm not here to judge you. I'm only judging me. That's what I'm required to do. But I want to be as skinny and I want to be as, as pure and holy as, as the Holy Spirit can help me to be. And that certainly doesn't mean I'm perfect. Amen. I got a long way to go. But you know what? I'm going. Amen. So, the question this morning is, are you a friend of the king? He's done his part. He died on the cross for you. He took your sins on the cross for you. He paid the price for you so that you could be holy and blameless and you could stand before God and you can be the friend of the king of kings. Are you willing to do what he asks? Please, every, every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's enter a time of prayer here. Marcia, will you please come and play for us? Just want you to think about the question. Are you a friend of the king this morning? If the king was come, come back, and I believe the days are growing short, every day you open the newspaper, it's all about the Middle East, it's about Syria, it's about Israel, it's about Iran. Every day, the world gets closer to that trumpet call, to the sound of the call of the angel, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who left on the earth, if we believe in Christ, if we're walking with Christ, we'll be taken up in the air with them. And we won't have to go through the seven years of tribulation. You ain't seen nothing yet. You look around the earth, think about that seven, seven years of tribulation. Are you a friend of the king this morning? I want to say a couple prayers. First, every, eye, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you don't feel like you're walking with the king, you don't feel like that, that if, if, the, if you were to die today or were to sound now that you'd go to heaven, you'd like to commit your life, you'd like to recommit your prayer. Just lift up your hand. Lift it down again. I'd like to say a special prayer. 